Thank you, Madam Speaker. In, in the clash of words and social media clickbait we are witnessing around this conflict, I feel it necessary to remind this House and Canadians that we're taking part in this critical debate as people, speaking from our own individual vantage points. It is the same for all who comment, who analyze, who interpret, and who express their opinions. We are all just people. We are here today, Madam Speaker, to deal in facts and to debate the unprecedented use of a tool of government to deal with a crisis. The Emergencies Act authorizes the taking of special, temporary measures to ensure safety and security during national emergencies. With its inception, it created more limited and specific powers for the federal government to deal with security emergencies of five different types national emergencies, public welfare emergencies, public order emergencies, international emergencies, and war emergencies. To demonstrate my support for deployment of the Act, I'm going to share facts from my vantage point. One I hope to also demonstrate comes from a place of love and deep respect for this country. Madam Speaker, I have formally trained in critical studies and education. I've had the privilege of studying the lenses of oppression in our society from a white gaze. I'm going to recommend that all who identify as the same check that privilege when having this discussion. And while we're talking about privilege, as a scholar of Canadian and international military history, we must also check our privilege as citizens in a democracy, in an ever-progressing judicial system designed to protect our individual freedoms. We represent less than 0.5% of the total world population with the second largest landmass. We are truly among the most privileged people in the world. We must never forget that. Madam Speaker, I challenge Canadians and members of this House to question their echo chambers, to check themselves, their privilege, and try to see things from the other side, even if it's only to strengthen their arguments, at least that moves past assumptions, which are the real scourge of our society. They are what really divides us. Many Canadians are being misled. These Canadians do not need us to encourage them or keep them blissfully ignorant. Today, far too much of Canadian discourse is hateful, reactionary and dangerous, and the political rhetoric that ramps it up is reprehensible. We are indeed facing extremism in Canada, and it is incumbent on each of us to call it what it is. As the New Brunswick Commissioner on Systemic Racism said, continuing to pretend that what we witnessed over the last three weeks was not a cover for a maturing anti-government, anti-pluralist, far-right extremism does nothing to combat the rising hate in this country. That extremism culminated in the occupation of our nation's capital and other key locations in a politically motivated coup attempt and requires decisive action with measures that are targeted, temporary, and proportionate. This is what has brought us here today. I've heard many in this house ask the question during this debate, how did we get here? It has been clear from the outset, long before the initial convoy colonizers arrived in Ottawa or Windsor or Surrey or Coutts, the intent has been to disrupt and indeed overthrow our government. This is not a simple question of public health mandates. This cannot be denied, and there is no integrity in calling these protests peaceful. A protest cannot be deemed peaceful unless every citizen feels safe and protected while being exposed to it. That was certainly not the experience of hundreds of people across this country and the residents in Ottawa. People were being harassed and intimidated by illegal occupiers simply because they were wearing masks. Women were targeted. Noise levels were unbearable. Hotel lobbies and retail spaces were taken over. Staff were terrorized. And ultimately, businesses were forced to close. The narrative that this was peaceful was false from the beginning. Madam Speaker, it feels as though conservatives are celebrating these occupations, purposefully inflaming the debate, intentionally escalating tensions while claiming the opposite. Sowing mistrust in government institutions and public health advice is causing further harm. I've had many conversations about vaccines specifically in my community, and I encourage people to listen to their healthcare providers, not politicians, and certainly not the loudest voices in an angry mob. In Ottawa, over the last three weeks, residents lost their sense of safety. Countless testimonials describe vitriol and harassment. Two SLGBTQ plus community members, racialized community members, women having to limit their movement, shelter at home, or as a last result, leave the city because they were not feeling safe. Terrorizing people for weeks is an act of violence, regardless of the perceived merits of the original intent. Minimizing what is happening here and how we got here is unacceptable, as is minimizing other large-scale demonstrations and incidents of civil disobedience because of what they too were trying to say and how they felt the need to express it. There is a lot to be learned from what has transpired. 
And Madam Speaker, I have committed to the people of Fredericton that with each new issue, I ask for input. I ask constituents to engage, to help me take the temperature, to listen, to learn, and to then act after thoughtful, informed, evidence-based consideration. I know I'm not alone in this house saying that I've received thousands of emails, letters, and calls, and had many conversations on what's been playing out. Many are asking to be heard, and I'm listening. And while there are many who have legitimate questions and concerns that I do my best to address, what I am also hearing are strings of false narratives and scapegoating. I see fear based on misinformation. A lot of people need help right now. That is unequivocally clear based on the number of threats I have received, that my staff has had to endure, that anyone involved has been subjected to. I've been told that my family is also at risk, that if I exercise my vote in a way that some do not agree with, that I should watch my back. Threats to our Prime Minister and all government members with bullets and nooses? Enough. Madam Speaker, that's how I know that these are not peaceful protesters. That's how I know that we have a very real and serious problem in Canada. I've been mad, disrespected, wronged. I've stood up. I have protested for justice for many causes, with the law on my side, within my rights, and with a firm understanding of the Charter. I also took things further when I felt that this wasn't enough. When I felt the system had failed and had to be changed, I organized and I ran for office, again, with great privilege. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication. It takes sacrifices and it takes a toll, but it is the greatest honor. And thanks to political financing laws, we are a collection of everyday Canadians who have the trust and respect of our electors. Madam Speaker, here in Canada, to vote is a sacred right and a duty, and I serve to protect that right every day in this House. And for those who disagree with me, based on the laws of this land, under our flag that has been so disrespected, they do not get to shut down critical infrastructure, illegally disrupt the lives of Canadians and endanger public safety. We are not living in a dictatorship. We are not living in tyranny. The misleading, the agitating, the grifting, the harassment, the threats must all come to an end. And it has become clear that after three weeks of coordinated, foreign-funded and right-wing white supremacy infiltration, that we have reached the threshold of emergency requiring the implementation of this act. I have heard Conservative members of this House suggest that this is not necessary, that we have not met the threshold, that there are more options available, and that our focus must be on de-escalation. And on that last point alone, Madam Speaker, I agree. We absolutely must de-escalate, which is what we see unfolding before us in a renewed law enforcement operation, initiated only after engaging the Emergency Measures Act. In the words of Interim Ottawa Police Chief, without the additional legislation, we could not have done what we did. De-escalation was stopping the weekend protest tourism from ramping up again in Ottawa. De-escalation is stopping the never-ending stream of supplies and funds from siege supporters laughing in the wings. Compromise has been on the table since the beginning. And in comparison with how demonstrators of different stripes have been treated in mere hours of assembly, suggests to me, as far as law enforcement and government goes, that we have been more than tolerant, perhaps unjustifiably so, and I would support a national inquiry into the original police response. I was born and raised in a military town with military roots and a deep respect for our Canadian armed forces. I was also raised to respect the men and women in police uniforms serving and protecting our communities. Having said this, and after watching video of uniformed police saying this feels like war with a service weapon on their hip or high-fiving, smiling for selfies, using squad cars as carnival rides, turning a blind eye on bylaw and criminal code infractions, or when I have neighbors from my local military community threaten me directly, we have a very serious problem. And I'm white, Madam Speaker. I can only imagine how some Canadians who may have demonstrated in their lives against oppression must be feeling as they watched how white protest protesters were comfortably dealt with over the last weeks. Watching the entitlement of those who party in hot tubs with their barbecues and fireworks, having street fires or stockpiling diesel and propane near the parliamentary precinct claim oppression, claim that we do not live in a free society, claim that there was no other recourse for their grievances to be heard. Enough. This needs to stop. And that's what this government is committed to doing. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Regina, Wisconsin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does the Honourable Member really think that the trucker convoy is going to take over the federal government? And if so, how? The Honourable Member for Fredericton. 
Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank the member for that question. Uh, there was a very clearly stated outcome in a, in a widely circulated memorandum of understanding that specifically set out the terms and demands uh, of, of this occupation, and it was indeed to overthrow the government uh, by having a special committee selected by Canada Unity, I believe is the name, um, with the Governor General and uh, the Senate. So, yes, I, I do believe that was the stated intent. Thank you very much. Je remercie ma collègue pour son discours. J'en retiens que, à son avis, la situation est, est intenable. Je partage son point de vue. Ce n'est pas normal qu'on installe les barbecues et qu'on occupe une rue comme ça euh, pendant trois semaines. Mais je, je comprends qu'à son avis, il n'y avait rien à faire, que son gouvernement n'avait pas les moyens de, de démanteler ces barrages-là. Et je comprends qu à, à sa réponse qu'elle vient de donner à mon autre confrère, que, mon autre collègue, pardon, qu'à son avis, euh, effectivement, son gouvernement n'aurait pas pu tenir et que les manifestants auraient pu, euh, bon, prendre le contrôle du gouvernement. Mais ce qui, att ce qui attire particulièrement mon attention, Madame la Présidente, c'est que j'aimerais savoir si elle est d'accord avec son propre premier ministre de sa province, parce qu'elle est député de Fredericton au Nouveau-Brunswick, et euh, le compte-rendu qui est annexé à la proclamation euh, dont on parle, Madame la Présidente, nous indique en page 6 que le premier ministre du Nouveau-Brunswick, et je cite, aurait affirmé qu'il n'estimait pas l'application de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence nécessaires dans sa province, étant donné que les forces de l'ordre ont la situation <coughs> bien en main. Est-ce que je comprends que ma collègue... doit donner l'opportunité à la députée de Fredericton de répondre. Um, merci, Madame la Présidente, et merci à mon collègue pour sa question. Uh, and, I, I, you know, it should come as no surprise that I, I often disagree uh, with my Premier uh, on many, many issues. Um, and, and based on some of the things that he has said over the last year in particular, it does not surprise me um, that he is, is putting forward some resistance um, to this measure. Um, so I'm, I'm not shocked at all that I disagree. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Uh, you're, uh, you're on mute. The Honourable Member is on mute. And thank you, Madam Speaker. Am I now? Uh, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the member for raising the reality of hate that all in this House over the past few days have denounced as one single point of consensus that I've heard. Could the member, through the chair, could the member talk about how we as parliamentarians can deal with this going forward? Fredericton. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I sincerely thank the, the member um, for that question. Uh, you know, my background is in education. Education is the key. Uh, Anti-racism education is the key. Uh, we have to keep confronting these realities. Um, and I think, you know, based on the progressive nature of Canada over the last couple of years, um, it, it really shouldn't shock any of us that there, there, such resistance has, has been met with this progression. Um, and so I think it's just about keep moving forward, keep having these conversations, keep calling out the hate when we see it, keep making sure it is unacceptable in our society, uh, and, and we just have to believe in, in better. Um, so I still have hope, despite what we've seen over the past couple of weeks. Um, I know that Canadians um, can do better, and, and, and members in this House, we can do better as well. Thank you. Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I want to thank the Honourable Member for Fredericton for her thoughts. And I, I just want to say on a personal level how deeply, deeply distressing it is to imagine that people in her own community uh, are making her feel physically threatened based on how she may vote on a matter here in the House of Commons. I want to ask this. It seems to me that the, the, the convoy exposes white supremacists and racism in a well-organized alt-right network that is fueled by social media, Facebook, and Russian sites, not just here but elsewhere. The problem is the Emergencies Act can only last 30 days. We're uncovering a cesspool that will take years to clean up. How does the honor member think we can cut short the Emergencies Act, which I think if we keep it should be done very soon, and not let go of what we're discovering? Honorable member for Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank my honourable colleague from Sanders Gulf Island. It's so lovely to see her in the House. Um, you know, you said it, it. It's about, you know, how do we keep this going? We cannot forget. I mentioned in my speech about the, the lessons that are, are to be learned from this and the whole pandemic experience. Um, it really has exposed the, the deep crevices in our society, the inequalities. Um, I know the member from Winnipeg Centre talks a lot about wealth inequality in particular, poverty. There's so many things we need to tackle, um, but the key is doing it together. That's the unity I want to see in this house. Thank you, Madam Speaker.